these are pictures from the farm We're back in the early 40s, my sister Gloria and me and, and, and my mom and and uh, picture of my uncle Dale and my sister and me and his new bike. This is all in a little farm in Michigan. My grandpa and my grandma and my mother, and my sister and me, my sister and me, and our swing set. My first bow and arrow my grandpa bought me. This is my grandma Twitchell, my, my, my grandma's mother. My, my, my grandpa's mother and my grandmother's mother and my grandpa's mother uh, are, when I painted the freeway lady she's a combination of those two perfect combination of those two great grandmothers and this is uh, after I received my third stripe in London I first painted Steve McQueen in 19 71. I was a junior at Cal State Los Angeles. I hadn't discovered acrylic paints yet. I was using just oil-based cheap enamel paints, which was a lot of people were using back then. Very, very seldom do they use them today. And it didn't last. It lasted maybe 10 years and it started to deteriorate even, even sooner than that. And a lot of the photographs I see of the original one is starting to deteriorate and it's hard for me to look at. I repainted it circa 1980-81. It had the oil had depleted from the wall from the sun and I just sort of sanded it down and painted gel medium over the top of it and painted it again with acrylic. And that did last. A lot of the photographs are from that era. And that was up for I guess about 20 years or something. But then it was sort of mysteriously painted out. And it had been painted out by mistake. Uh, they had been asked by the city to fix the house up a little bit and there was a, a language problem and the people <laughs> painted the mural out and they were wanting to get the mural back and so this the third time I did it by that time I had been since about 86 I had started painting in the studio on materials printing on the wall with gel medium and I had discovered polytab which is ab absolutely permanent and so I painted the final Steve McQueen which is about 2008 2009 with on polytab in the studio and put him up on the wall and then touched him up and now that's the way it looks today and each time I did it I did it a little bit better. Luis, the king of dog walkers, Ken, the king of murals. He's a dog walker, great oh, guy. Yeah. My, yeah. my son does that sometimes. Yeah. So this is where Fountain Avenue starts right here. Okay, yeah, yeah. I knew of Kent's work. I mean, I passed the freeway lady on the 101 probably a few hundred times. I went to see the Steve McQueen mural and the Struther Martin mural, which I remember in somebody's home, <laughs> you know, some time ago, I'm talking back in the 70s. But I know that he saw the artists, Los Angeles artists, as making a spiritual connection for all of us. So. First painted Stephen McQueen uh, in 1971. I was a junior at Cal State Los Angeles, and it was just a matter of the, the art departments and the art students were they were so kind of elitist. And I mean, I'm a farm kid. You know, what do I know about this stuff? I, and but I love to paint and draw, so I consider myself a folk artist rather than a modernist and all this garbage. And I just wanted to paint Steve McQueen because I really, really liked Steve McQueen. I was a folk artist. And uh, uh, Rebecca Yoon, whose family grew up, she grew up in that house, and her parents went on vacation to Hawaii. She, she was Korean, and uh, got permission for me to paint a movie star. Well, they heard star, so they thought it was going to be some kind of a, a pretty celestial uh, painting, I guess. I didn't realize it. And I was going to paint it on the side, but then I saw the front of the house and I thought, I'll paint it there. And so I just painted Steve McQueen there. It took me, I don't know, two or three weeks. And uh, luckily the LA Times fell in love with it. They put it two days in a row, big pictures of it in the LA Times. And uh, when they got back, they, the fact that it had become famous like overnight helped keep it there. And it was there all these years. It's, been, it's one of the oldest, perhaps the oldest extant mural from the mural movement, you know, in LA, I restored it twice. 
Yeah, the beauty is it's a discovery. It isn't something that you see every day like an ad. Right. You all of a sudden, drive, like McQueen himself, right. um, the LA Times did a subsequent article many years later, and I think it was after he had died, and they talked to his son, Chad, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, he didn't even, I don't even think he knew it was there. I mean, he was a big star, even, right. even though it was all over the world. Right. I mean, come on, Steve McQueen, he's yeah. got bigger things on his mind. He discovered it one day just driving around town at night in his pickup. Right. Uh, right. Chad uh, told the told the Times and uh, came home and woke him up yeah. and told him somebody put my mug up on a, yeah. on a, on a wall. I've just said there's nothing like Steve McQueen in so many roles that he was in, but I especially like when he was in Bullet and driving that uh, Mustang uh, all over San Francisco. Oh, geez. I originally painted Strother Martin in 1971, right after I'd finished Steve McQueen. I got a letter at Cal State LA from a person who had just bought the building and he had seen the Steve McQueen in all the newspapers and everything and said I could do anything I wanted on his building, so I decided to paint Strother Martin. And once I got to know him, then I went back and I put color into his face. And then I wanted to put an Afghan behind him, which was my first Afghan. And my grandmother made an Afghan for me. She lived in Hollywood, and it was just all monochromatic and reds, light and dark reds and black. Again, I had done it with oil, cheap enamel paints, because I had no budget. And it, it began to deteriorate from the wall, and I went back years later and painted him again, this time with acrylics. And uh, to restore the, the Afghan, this time I did the Afghan in color. I just added a bunch of color to it. Never to get it completely finished. It was just sort of sitting there, and, and there's a lot of pictures in magazines and books and stuff of, of it. A half painted Afghan in different colors. It was m mistakenly painted out. And this time I came down and I painted the new face, much more detailed face this time of Strother Martin, and I painted the Afghan in my studio up north on Polytab, as I later did the, the Steve McQueen. My son helped me paint it in the studio, and that's the way it looks today. Well, one of his more prominent roles was in Cool Hand Luke. He was the prison warden, and he one famous scene where he he kicked Paul Newman down into a ravine, and he felt a little bit embarrassed because he had done that, and his men had seen him do it. Now, what we have here is failure to communicate. That became, from the 70s, the most famous one line in, of all cinema was, was that. I did a lot of, stru of studies. When I do these murals, the McQueen and the Strother and the others, especially when I started doing them again and again, I would do more and more studies so that I could do them better and better each time. There's studies rolling around that people have on their walls. I don't even know who has them anymore. But I do a lot of studies, primarily in pencil. favorite character actor, right. Mr. Arthur Martin. Yeah. And uh, so he went up the same year, in 1971, in Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you look too, when you come down Union, you know, it's southbound on the right side of the street. Right. He's there waiting for you, just like that, yeah. which is so special. Yeah, or through the trees, yeah. all of a sudden, bam, yeah. there he is. Right. That's the way I like to see a discovery. Right, it's, discovery. It's That's unpretentious, right. boom, something beautiful, a, a, a jewel. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is. Yep. Right there, boy. You gotta get that city sign got knocked over. Look at that. They've been cleaning that, that half gun. Yeah. The, the neighborhood has. That looks good. This is a smoke shop. Look at the eye. Strother heard about it. Some of his friends, other character actors, saw it uh -huh. and told him about it. He said, they said, Strother, it's like Mount Rushmore, you gotta go see it. Right. So he went to see it and then he called me one day. I was living in Echo Park and he called me and I thought it was one of my friends, you know, because they knew I worshipped Strother Martin. Playing the gang. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so I was a little bit rude. And then, I, then he said something in his voice. I recognized, I thought, oh my God, this is really Strother Martin. Right, right, right. right. Oh, I can't, couldn't believe it. The bride and groom mural is, for some reason, has been in more things, more books, more movies than practically all my other pieces put together. I don't know why. 
it was in Death Wish 2, the last scene, which is the most dramatic scene of the whole movie. I started it in 1973. I painted the groom in 73, and it just took off. It was all over the place. People just loved it. And then I painted the bride's head. At first, I was going to paint a girlfriend I had at Cal State LA, but my but Carlos, who I had decided to use as my groom, he was the, the one that was the, that owned the, the, the business. They had given me free reign to do anything I wanted. And he says, why don't you paint my girlfriend? <laughs> it's your money, okay, fine. And he says, well, let's use Joey Furiani for, for and so I painted the, the first uh, woman's hair and then Joey Furiani's face. I didn't realize why, but I ran out of gas. At least a year, there was the groom fully painted and the bride's head and the hair flowing off. And it was that way for a year, which was kind of crazy. And then I, a writer that was doing a piece for, uh, on me asked me why I had not finished it. And I said, I don't know, I just ran out of gas, I can't figure it out. And he says, well, when was the last time you felt good about it? And I says, well, let me, let me think. It was when I, it, before I started painting the bridal gown. He said, well, that's your, that's your problem. The, you don't like the bridal gown. I said, you're right. It was a modern bridal gown and I just couldn't, but I, but I had put so much work in detailed drawings of the bridal gown that I couldn't face the fact that I didn't want to paint that bridal gown. He said, just throw, throw them all away and, and paint a, a bridal gown that you want. So I, call, I called the company and says, give me your most elaborate old fashioned bridal gown, which I did. And then uh, that was the, the bridal gown I used. And then, uh, so I, I think within a year or so, I painted the entire, I ran out of gas again about a, about a, oh, maybe 10, 12 feet up. I painted all the bridal gowns and, and just too much of this stuff, it was boring. And so I had a big party with all my friends who had wanted to help me paint. And I, and I mixed up all the paint in numbers, one through eight of the different shades of the, of the blue that made up the, the bridal gown. All it was is the lower part of the bridal gown. And we had ladders and we and, and, and Carlos, who was my groom, he was there and Joey Furiani was there. And uh, a friend of mine who had a bluegrass band was there and, and some uh, uh, mariachi band came and we had food and we just made a big party of it and all my friends I didn't have to touch it. They just painted by the numbers all the way down and finished it in, in one day and afternoon. And so it was finished in 1976. I used to travel around a lot making TV shows. So I find myself, you know, sitting in New York City or Montreal in some alleyway or it's at four o'clock in the morning and I end up writing up some ideas and some thoughts and I send them out to people and I send them to Ken. And he always responded right away. He always responded with, with extraordinary interest you know he once again I mean I think there's a, a, a symbiosis between him and Lillian I said to you earlier this sort of Egyptian almost antique pharaonic if, if there's such a word you know nature of Ken's work it's gigantic work that speaks you know if people are looking in from outer space they, 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 it's, that's some of the stuff they're gonna notice but it all comes from his sense of humanity I mean when you look at those people there's a, a, a live thing happening you know, the, 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 the wonderful married couple on the wall of that blue building down in L.A. and that, that marriage clothing store, whatever, whatever the hell it was. It, it was so alive with, with the history of Los Angeles, with, with, with the, the, the Mexican, Hispanic history of Los Angeles, this extraordinary place, which really is a Mexican town. I mean, that's what L.A. is. And, and, and there's that, that sort of iconic, right in the middle of L.A., this is who we are. This is our place. You know, we've laid our crap on top of it, but it's really what the, what the energy and the, and the stuff is. And I think Kent gets that, you know? What he's tapped into is the fact that we are a reflective culture. We live in our entertainment. We live in our movies, in our television. That's where we complete the cycle of our, of our consciousness. We used to compare, compare ourselves to our neighbors, and now we, now we live our lives in, in, in relation to these sort of fictional realities that we see that surround us. And, and, and there's something extraordinary about that, you know, that, that, that that's where our intimacy lies now, you know, and, and, and we know as much about Steve McQueen as we do about our brothers because, because he has been so intimate with us in that privacy of that movie theater or, or on our TV screens and we've seen right into his soul and, and that, 
that's something we don't really get with our family. We don't really get with our people because it, it, it's just not the way we live. So there's something extraordinarily prescient about that from Kent's standpoint, that he understands we are intimate with these people on a level that he can use to tell his stories. Well, that was painted mostly in 1973. And it is finally starting to need some restoration. It's been destroyed on the bottom by spray paint vandalism, of course, like everything else in LA. I painted the freeway lady in 1974. It was sort of a couple of years after I had graduated from Cal State LA. I was sort of floundering around looking for, and a year before I started at Otis. And I, I had discovered at Cal State LA that there was a lot of elitism in, in all the art departments and in, 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 in visual art, in, in fine art. And I wanted to paint, and I'm, I'm a farm kid, you know, I'm milking cows. I'm more comfortable milking cows and feeding chickens than I was uh, being a refined artiste. And so I wanted to do something that was very sort of uh, naive, like uh, Thomas Hart Benton or, 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 or uh, some of my favorite artists, Norman, Norman Rockwell and some of those people, uh, Grant Wood. And so I decided to do a monument to my grandmother, which was the most uncool, unhip thing I can think of. But it was something that was very real to me. And I went to the Screen Actors Guild in Hollywood and looked uh, through the catalogs of what they call characters and comedians. And Lillian Bronson looked like a, a, a clone between my gr grandmother, great grandmother Twitchell and my great grandmother Fredline, both of who were very close to me. And so I decided uh, to call her up. Uh, but then Lillian Bronson herself called me later in the day. She was so nice. And so I met with her. And she seemed too young because my, my grandmothers were quite old. And she was only 71. And I wanted somebody older with lots of, you know, arthritis and stuff. And so I was g being polite to her, and she had an apartment in Hollywood. And so I went in the backyard, and I was photographing her with my camera and everything, and, and being polite. And then I began to realize when she got, she was a professional. She had been doing this, she had been playing old ladies since she was in her 30s. And I looked through the camera, and I thought, oh my God, this is, I said, you are the woman judge on Perry Mason. I never realized it. She said, yes, that's right. And so um, then I knew I was going to use her, definitely. And when I took my photographs, I began to realize that one of the things that made her so powerful was that her eyes, and I noticed when, when I photographed and, and did a, a, a portrait of, of Mayor Tom Bradley later, same thing with him. He had one eye different from the other, completely different characters. And with Lillian Bronson, one eye was, it was, was, uh, Absolutely loving, just unconditional love. The other one was judgmental. And it really depended on your mood and on maybe the clouds and, and, and whether it was dark or light and where the sun was as to what you saw when you drove by. And I thought, this is so powerful. And I noticed that when I began doing my studies and sketches of her, I noticed her eyes were, were different. So that gave it another sort of level. And uh, that was, for some reason, uh, th there was so, people loved that. It was in the front pages of newspapers all over the country. <laughs> it, it just hit something. It was just accidental, and uh, and then it was painted. It wasn't painted out. It was somebody threw a bunch of rags on it one time, and I went up and had to f fix it. But then uh, the owner of the building had a a. a um, motel put right in front of her it, that covered about I would say two-thirds of her at the bottom and from then on I just sort of lost it with it because I wanted her to all the way down with her hand and, and everything and then eventually he decided to sell that what was left of her to a sign company called Blue Wallscapes up in the Bay Area 
But there was such a big outcry from the city that they had to go up and paint out the, the, um, the phone number because people were just calling that phone number by the thousands and complaining. <laughs> And uh, I, th I, think she, I think she was on the cover four times of the calendar section of the LA Times that people were so mad they had to keep answering and, and fo did follow through. So I tried and tried and tried to restore it. But, uh, and then I finally we got up there and we restored the upper part. We had it about a third restored and some um, uh, vandals went up and just hit it with all kinds of spray paint. And it hadn't been protected yet because we were in the middle of restoring it. And so, that was it. And so uh, years later, what uh, finally I, I was able to restore it at, at the, uh, on the Student Services Building at LA Valley College, which was just a very few years ago, which is the way she looks now. Kent, who, who I think used that odd familiarity that we have, the world of, of film, the world of, of show business. We know so many people we've seen in films, we've seen on frames of film, the character actors that surrounded the stars in all the films. And he used those people and then put them in his own framework and it, and it spoke on a whole nother level to the people of Southern California as they drive by and they say, well, I who, what the hell? Who is that person? That, that person, you know, and, and that's what he did with Lily, when he, the lady of the freeway, and, and that's what he did with the, the three people on the wall of the Otis Art Institute. There was a kind of a weird statement because we already understood the nature of these people on some subliminal level. His structure and his metaphor to their sort of strange familiarity, and then you had something that was quite, it had, had a real, real uh, impact on a person staring at it, you know? The funny thing about that painting on the wall that Kent did was it was very foreboding to a lot of people. It seemed kind of scary. She seemed like a sort of a frightening presence, you know? The new one that's down at the Bat Valley College is very different. And I don't know if it's because of, of, of the vantage point of being on the freeway and being farther away from it, but Salish and I went down and we were looking at the one at Valley College last uh, Thanksgiving. And it's very open and, and her eyes are alive with sort of the thing that Lily really was, which was this sort of inclusive, joyful woman who loved living, you know. When I was a student of Charles White at Otis, he, we were walking, we, beca we became very close. Uh, and we were walking by the wall that I ended up painting and he suggested, it was his idea, he suggested that I paint something right. on this wall for my graduate thesis project. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, there are people who are always uh, complaining. There was this one woman, especially, that was always complaining to the dean who was teaching Renaissance art, the iconography, and because we had the nerve to be talking about the Virgin Mary or about Christ or right. about the, the apostles and everything. I thought, what? Is this how far it's gone? The separation of church and state has right. gone crazy. Right. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I will paint a religious painting on the side of Otis, which was then a government, it was a county. Right. So I'm going to paint a religious painting on a, on a county building. Right. And, but I'm not going, I'm going to use my own iconography. This, we, we learned a lot about iconography. I was going to create my own iconography. So I put three people in white lab coats, which was the wise men robes of today, right. modernism. Right. And I would, I would paint it after Masaccio's altarpiece. Uh, which was named the, the Holy Trinity with the Virgin and St. John. Mm -hmm. And I painted uh, Billy Gray, who was son and father knew best, which, which I grew up with. Right. He was the son of the father who knows best. Right. So he was my Christ figure. Yeah, yeah. And I painted Jan Clayton, the, the, the chaste mother on the original Lassie television series I right. grew up with, as the Virgin Mary. Yeah. And who else? As God the Father. But Clayton Moore, uh -huh. the Lone Ranger, right? Exactly. Without his, without, <laughs> without his, his mask. Yeah, without his mask. And I had to meet yeah. all of those people. They yeah. all had to agree to do it, or I had no project, and right. they all did. Yeah. In fact, Billy uh, Billy Gray used to come to my studio. Uh, yeah. Come to my. Uh, I lived in Pasadena at the time, mm -hmm. and he used to come uh, just drop by, and yeah. uh, we would, we would talk. We would be, we became friends, and he fell off his chair when I first told him he was going to. was what, I, what my idea was. He wow. just loved it, and when I met uh, uh, Clayton Moore, uh, the uh, I was really scared because yeah. I, I grew up with a little ranger. I mean, the guy seemed like he was probably about your height. You're about what, 6'2"? Well, I'm not 6'2", but Brother Bobby is. But uh, 
I'm uh, six flat. Yeah, yeah, he was about, I think that's probably about who he was, six, yeah. but he's seen about six yeah, six. Yeah, he had those boots When I first on. met him, I, yeah. he, he looked six six. Right. He was just so, Yeah. and uh, he was out running, and I, I was waiting for him, and he came to his house uh, and uh, Westlake. And, uh, but he had these glasses on, I never did see his eyes, and then yeah. we went inside, and uh, his wife didn't really, didn't really, uh, Trust me, because right. a lot of people are trying to get to him all the time. Sure. Of course, you know he, yeah. she was a protector. And then we sat at the ta table and inside, and I explained to him why I wanted him to pose for me, and I wanted him to pose as God the Father. Right. And he sat there for a second and turned to his wife and he said, "I think that would be okay, don't you, dear?" Yeah. And she says, "Yes, Clayton, that would be okay." Right. And then he took his glasses off and threw them on the coffee table in front of him. And the sun was coming through the windows at his eyes. His eyes were light gray. I thought I was going to pass out. It was yeah. so, it was so powerful. Right. But then he became. Uh, I, I, I was so nervous. I, I photographed him that day, but they didn't turn out. Yeah. Just, and so I had to go back. And then I went back. I think the third time and got the photographs that I wanted. By that time, we were friends. Yeah. We would go into his den and sit on the floor and play with all the stuff and he was like uh, any of these really big uh, Hollywood artists are are 12 years old really right we're all 12 right but we yeah. just co we're covering that up right but we finally were two 12 year olds sitting on the floor playing with all the stuff you yeah. know was it he was the greatest guy in the world well that's so special and you think of the inspiration there uh, now with the school. Yeah, the name. I told him I was going to pay three people in white lab posts. Yeah. That's all I said. That's all I ever said. Right. But then the LA Times, and they were always so good to me through the years, thank yeah. God. They came and interviewed me after I was done, and uh, then just as he was finishing, the the, uh, the writer turned back and said, oh, by the way, what do you call it? I thought, uh-oh, here yeah. it comes. I said, I call it the Holy Trinity with the Virgin. Right. He said, what? Yeah. And he, crumbled up his notes and started all over again. And the next day there was this big picture of Billy Gray about this big in the LA Times. Right. And uh, Peter Clothier was the uh, dean and he got a bunch of phone calls and people, no, Baptists hated it, atheists hated it, Jew, right. Jews hated it, I, it didn't please anybody. Right. And then he said, what are you, a religious fanatic or something? And I said, Peter, if you want me to, I'll just paint it out. I don't want to hurt yeah. the school. Right. You know, I, I thought it would be, you know, as an American, it, I could say that the, the trees represented crosses, and, and I still had the right to do it. Right. Uh, all I said was these people represented these other people to me. Yeah. But uh, there's no crosses in there. There's no uh, iconography that everybody would understand. And so he just said, "Write me a, a statement," which I did. Yeah. And uh, that, and it's still there. Yeah. That's a great picture. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a great mural. See that same picture? It's a picture of the picture. Let's look at it. All I've got to do is put a yellow glaze over the faces and the flesh tones. Just a slight yellow glaze, that's all I need to do. And then put gesso, less gesso in the back. It's not titanium, it's gesso. Jan Clayton, the original mother of the, uh, TV's Lassie. Billy Gray, the son of Father Knows Best. And Clayton Moore, the Lone Ranger. Finally, with Kent, it's, it's the totality of communication. It's the totality of art, which is to reach out and touch his fellows with a feeling, with a feeling, what it feels like to be alive, what it feels like to be a human. He opens a door and then everyone responds with themselves. And I think that's why stuff's so powerful. I think it's so powerful because he cares. He's a, a, an alive, electric human being. Thank you. 
Thank you.